Jim Harris has been a commercial fisherman for more than 20 years and has had his own boat, the Abracadabra, for nearly 10. On June 20th, 1995, as was usual during the summer months, Jim's 13-year-old son, Jimmy, was on board helping the crew. They were expecting to all be safely back on shore in two days. We go out for two, three days at a time. Jimmy's been going out since he was four years old. It's great having Jimmy out on the boat. We actually spend more time in the boat together than we do at home. Bill Peter had been working on the boat for Jim for five years. We don't have to ice the squid because we have the refrigerated seawater system. All it is is actually a giant air conditioner. It's charged with three on it, but instead of cooling air, it cools water. Bill's brother Michael was the third member of the crew. We like to have Jimmy around. He's one of the nicest little kids I've ever met. And he's become more than just a little friend. I love Jimmy. I love him like a brother. We were about 70 miles out to sea, and we already made two toes for the day. All right, guys, get ready to hold that in. Okay, Captain. Yeah. I came out of the cabin and Jimmy wasn't there. Jimmy! My first instinct is to look in the water. Jimmy! He wasn't anywhere in sight. All of a sudden, I mean, just had this very bad feeling in my gut. Jim! Jim! We started to get a little bit panicky because it had been like 20 minutes since we, we had seen him. No, he's not inside. Jimmy, you up there? Hey, Jim, where are you? We noticed that the hatch was open. Jim! Jim! Who's his hand, Lee? As soon as I got to the bottom of the ladder, my whole body just went numb. I knew it was a Freon leak. I looked to the back of the fish hole and saw him. Oh my God, he was floating face down, no movement. It's the scariest thing I've ever seen in my life. Jim! Jimmy's been hurt! The water's 32 degrees. It's freezing cold. He can't take it for very long. His body was limp and cold. Sheer panic was going through my mind because I didn't know what happened. The biggest thing that went through my mind was, what did I do to my son? Why did I have to bring him on that boat? I started being overcome by the fumes. I thought I was going to pass out. I don't know how Bill was able to stay conscious. He was down at the deepest concentration for probably a good two minutes, just breathing nothing but that. There was no air down there. He was blue. He was limp. He was like a rag doll. The feeling of that is you have your son in your hands, and, and he's basically dead. There was no breath. There was no pulse. But the Freon gas displaces oxygen. It's just like uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. Jim immediately said, start CPR, and he ran in to call the Coast Guard. But I didn't think, from what I saw, that there was anything that could actually bring him back. K-Mate Coast Guard, K-Mate Coast Guard. Abracadabra, Abracadabra. We need a helicopter. We need a helicopter quick. It's going to be seven or eight hours before I could get back to shore. My boat only got 10 miles an hour. Hover Cadaver Coast Guard, do take me. Roger, Captain. I understand you have a 13-year-old boy with radiation poisoning. Can you tell me how he acquired that over? Free on, free on. Refrigeration, free on. Poisoning. Roger, Captain. Is he conscious at this time? Negative, negative. We are giving him CPR at this time. Abracadabra, Coast Guard, vacate me, Roger, Captain. You are giving him CPR at this time. Is he breathing over? Kate May, Kate May. He is not breathing, and he also has hypothermia. He was in 32 degree water. One, two, three, four, five, three. One, two. It was a new Coast Guard regulation five, three, that at least one person on the boat had to know CPR. On, but all three of us were certified for it. 
Every time we'd do a compression, water would come spewing out of his mouth. It's the scariest, the scariest, most frightening thing I've ever been through in my life. Now I probably made ten trips from the pilot house to the back deck to see if he had a pulse. There's nothing. Give him another breath. Every time he would say no, I sank a little deeper. Because the nearest base was 70 miles away, it would take the helicopter at least 35 minutes to get to the scene. One. There was a little wheezing, and we're like, oh my God, oh my God. All right, check him, Mike. We checked his pulse, and we were getting a very faint pulse. All right, great, great, let's get him over. Get it was a great relief to see Jimmy started to take a breath on his own, but I knew the next thing we had to do was start treating him for hypothermia. Group Kate Mae. Group Kate Mae, Roger, what is the condition of the boy? He is breathing, but he's still unconscious. We are just trying to warm him up at this time. Over. Roger, Cam, I appreciate that. Have you removed his clothes and wrapped him up in that blanket? I knew the best thing to do for hypothermia was body to body heat. So I climbed underneath the sleeping bag with him and just hugged him and let my body transfer the heat to him. Roger, Roger, we've done that. There's, there's a lot of water coming out of his nose and mouth, being in the water. Jimmy was spitting up very dark colored water. Me, it was Jim? the water with the squid ink in it. The squid ink, when you get it on your hands, it can cause like a blister. But I didn't know what kind of damage squid ink was going to do to his lungs. Yeah, you're doing a good job. Just hang in there. We're on our way, and I'm sure he's going to be just fine. Hang in there. Roger, Roger, we're on our way. How's he doing, Bill? I've never seen Jim look quite so scared in my life. You could tell that he was being eaten alive inside. I would have sold my soul at that point to have him back. Within 45 minutes, the Coast Guard arrived, including EMT Petty Officer John Hall. As I was being lowered down to the fishing boat, there was a little fear in my mind. There might be nothing I can do for this little boy. Hang in there, Jimmy. How's he doing? Not good, not good. He was breathing at this moment, and he did have a weak pulse, but that could have changed at any moment. There isn't a worse feeling in the world, seeing your son going off into sunset and not knowing whether you're ever going to see him again alive. And if he was alive, what kind of condition he was going to be in, whether he was going to be brain dead, whether he was going to be a vegetable. Petty Officer Guy Rush was the flight engineer. I've been doing this for quite some time. He looked incredibly bad. I believe he was the worst I've ever seen. I wanted to do my best to get him to the hospital as quickly as possible, but I didn't know if that was going to make a difference at this time. 13-year-old Jimmy Harris was taken to Atlantic City Medical Center's trauma unit and examined by emergency physician Carlene Sinclair. He was in very bad shape. He was demonstrating what is called decerebrate posturing, which is something we see in patients with severe, severe brain injury. There are times when they may present like this and still get better, but it's very rare. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mrs. Harris? By the time Jimmy's father and mother Bertie were at the hospital, the boy's condition had been assessed. The doctor told us that the damage to his lungs was so severe that they expected a 50-50 chance of survival. And if he does survive, I'm not sure. That was when we've all just lost it. They're not supposed to tell you that your child's going to die. Okay. When two days passed without sign of improvement, Jimmy was transferred to St. Christopher's Hospital for Children and put under the care of pulmonologist Howard Panich. Jimmy's lungs were very sick and might in fact be the cause of death. It was at that time that his father remembered 
there were some defoaming agents in the water that he was submerged in. It was possible that this defoaming agent in the water might have washed out a uh, natural compound called surfactant from his lungs. Occasionally when we give surfactant the oxygen level. Surfactant therapy is routinely used for newborn infants, but it has only experimentally been used in older patients. Whatever it takes, give it to them. Usually the amount used is one vial. In our patient, we used upwards of about 40 vials. The first 12 hours in Philadelphia was very hard. It was touch and go. But when we would ask him questions, Jimmy, squeeze my hand if you can hear Dad. and he was able to respond Good. with hand signals, we knew that he's going to be fine. We knew that he was going to have a lot of therapy, but we knew that it was going to be a piece of cake. Two months have passed since the incident. I remember opening up the hatch to the fish hole, and then I remember waking up in the hospital, seeing my mom and dad. I don't think there's any question he's probably one of the luckiest kids alive. Every time I see him, I just laugh now, just because he's alive, he's there, and uh, there was a chance that he wasn't going to be for a while. Don't pick up my brother. Anyone got scissors? <laughs> if I didn't have so many people to care about me, I might not have been here. I got him. <laughs> Mike and Bill are definitely a part of this family. Without them, I wouldn't have my son. I'm never, never going to be able to fire him, man. That's for damn sure. <laughs> it's a great regulation that they made us learn CPR. Everyone thought it was a little bit of a pain when we first heard about it, but if it wasn't for CPR, he wouldn't be here right now. We're just all ecstatic that he's back with us. I probably won't be picking on him as much anymore. <laughs> Jimmy's younger sister, Jennifer, shares their relief. He's back to his own self because we're fighting again. It's good to have him back because I love him. <laughs> Jimmy is just about back to 100% normal. There's still some lung damage, but he can do just about everything he did before the accident. He can run, he can walk, he can play, and he can go back out on that boat with me. My dad's a really great guy. I love being out on the boat with my dad. It's always been fun, from the first trip I made with him to my last trip. I can't wait to go back out fishing to spend more time with my dad. I love you too.